Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Hai Bin Su. I'm the associate professor in chemistry department of this university. So today it's our great honor to have Professor Atia Bolius and to give us this uh, very special distinguished lecture for the Institute of Advanced Study. Uh, before um, Professor Bolius lecture, I just give a very brief introduction um, about uh, Professor Bolius. Professor Bodius' research focuses on the, um, the organisms that live on parts of the seabed that have a major impact on the global climate. She was the first marine microbiologist to prove the existence of the microbial community consisting of bacteria that reduce sulfate and um, mesonotrophic um, archaea on the ocean floor. Uh, she also has done a lot of other, more uh, other things and also received um, many awards. So among them, I just mentioned two recent awards. One is uh, the Carl Gauss Medal, together with Gustav Stemann Medal. Also, she's a, a member of European Academy of Science and a fellow of American Academy of Microbiology. Without uh, further delay, let's welcome you. Professor Bortier's uh, lecture. Thank you. So good morning. Um, I think this is a modern day of university education when one is filmed and uh, provides digital lectures rather than speaking to people. But um, I'm happy that I can talk a little bit about uh, the subject of my research, which is deep ocean space and questions of ecosystem functions and impacts. And, uh, we are just at the end now of a Gordon Research Conference on marine biogeochemistry, um, which was uh, incredibly interesting and fascinating to discuss with international lead scientists about future and past and present of the ocean. And uh, it was uh, wonderful to be here on this campus, um, very inspiring, of course, for ocean research because everywhere around us is the ocean. Now, I looked a bit at the um, study plans, the research objectives of uh, uh, this uh, university and uh, the, the research areas that are called the strategic cluster areas. And I thought all of them are very useful for what you need to be a good ocean scientist today. So to know all about data science is of course very important. To uh, do research with a framework concept that has to do with the sustainability of uh, our earth and our society to uh, know how autonomous systems and robotics can help us uh, exploring uh, remote environments, but also human space. And then also to think about uh, the chances and opportunities we have for um, entrepreneurship and uh, uh, businesses is all very relevant for the future of ocean research. I would like to start with a small introduction of uh, where we are today, what are our great problems uh, that we face, and then give you three case studies of research uh, that I'm involved in, and my institute, the Alfred Wegener Institute is, so that you can see how much we connect all of these uh, areas uh, to do our ocean research today. One of my favorite images of Earth is uh, this one. So this is when uh, you um, look uh, at uh, Earth from space, and uh, that's where this saying comes from, that Earth should actually be called ocean, because uh, when you look onto the uh, Great Pacific, you almost see no land from this perspective. The red dot is where we are today, Hong Kong. So we can take the other view, of course, and this is the common view probably for the people living here, that uh, we look from land out to the ocean, and uh, we have understood in the past uh, uh, in the past decades, but uh, probably since the beginning of humankind, um, that the ocean is core to our livelihoods. It's where life emerged. It's where we do our businesses today and where we build our cities. And uh, one of these uh, fantastic uh, numbers to, to know is that uh, when we count where humans live today and in the future, it all has to do with access to the oceans. So this image shows you the distribution of cities around the Earth, megacities. And we know um, from a large uh, German research program on megacities that uh, it is estimated that in 2020, which is uh, very soon, half of the Earth's 8 billion people will, will live by the sea. And that is in direct contact then with the oceans. 
We also know from studies about how we humans and the oceans interact that we have to worry about this uh, increasing population of the coasts and the oceans. So what you see here is a large uh, res international research program where um, we monitored various uh, ecosystem indicators in mostly focused on human uses of uh, ocean and land resources. And you can see that uh, we have rated already that wherever there are lots of humans, wherever there's lots of river runoff, eutrophication, um, warming, and many other problems, we'll put already an alert to those ecosystems. They are impacted by our uses, but uh, we know too little yet about the large uh, open ocean space to, to know exactly where we are with the question of the ocean, ocean Health Index. And I come back to the question of ocean health again and again. We use this concept today, so ocean health is a concept that includes the interaction between men and the ocean. So, of course, it is a very human approach to the ocean to think of its health. We should rather worry about our own health, but we use this uh, because that's a way how to explain um, the indicators, the ecosystem indicators, their changes uh, to the public and to um, more than just uh, natural sciences. What is specific about the deep ocean space? So even if you come from non-marine studies, um, um, everyone probably knows today that 60% of the Earth is deep. So we are um, larger than three, uh, we're deeper than 3,800 meters is the average depth of Earth. And uh, during the conference, we heard some data about the deepest parts, 11 kilometers, the Mariana Trench. And what I find always amazing is that uh, the ocean is, uh, represents 90% of the inhabited space on Earth. So when you count where insects and birds fly, and when you count uh, where the fish uh, and the sea cucumbers uh, um, and the microbes occupy uh, Earth, then you'll find out that really 90% uh, is the ocean. It's where most of Earth's biodiversity remains to be discovered. And it's still a very, from the human perspective, very strange ecosystem because of its high pressure, the darkness, the permanent darkness, and uh, the average ocean temperature close to freezing point. How do we get there? So um, during my time when I grew up uh, from being a kid to a student to a professor today, um, our generation has, uh, is at the time of the uh, deep sea ecosystem discovery by the help of ships and robots. Of course, humans use ships uh, since the beginning of humankind, but the ability to really dive deeper than a few tens of meters is new to us. And this has to do with similar that with space research. It has about the same time scale. And uh, the future, of course, of ocean sciences is including uh, robots. So we mostly will um, discover and measure um, what is going on in the oceans by robots. Myself, uh, it's one of my favorite, most favorite activities besides giving lectures, of course, um, to dive to the oceans. And um, I have used uh, man submersibles as well as robots, mostly robots uh, recently. But I find this moment uh, really uh, special when, when we humans enter a submersible and we start diving, we start leaving our atmosphere, we start leaving our relationship to Earth and explore the one that, that is under high pressure. So to give you an image of this, uh, just feel for a moment as if you were diving. The first thing everyone notes is that when we leave the light penetrated surface layer, the agitated surface layer, you first feel the waves, uh, then you see it's getting darker and darker, and then you're in absolute darkness. But at that time, so at around 500 meters, you meet the strange ocean life um, that uh, represents to me still one of the great wonders of Earth. How is it possible that in this dark, energy limited, cold ocean, you'll have all of these amazing organisms that shine light, that make light themselves, or that are highly adapted to this ocean space. And we still know very little. So during the conference we had last week, we shared a lot of data. And every, basically, every presenter had to say, well, we don't know enough um, of this ocean realm. And this is because we have so few ships and robots to, to dive with us. So um, one of the, um, the last uh, um, assessments we did about knowledge in the deep ocean came uh, out with these uh, uh, incredible numbers that uh, the proportion of deep space uh, water column investigated uh, by sampling and by human presence is just tiny. We cannot even pronounce that fraction of a 1% uh, that we have assessed. And uh, biologists know that uh, each uh, cubic kilometer of ocean contains different forms of life. And then we immediately understand 
how much there remains to be discovered. But at the same time, um, we are changing the face of Earth and also the deep ocean. This is uh, an animation that explains to you how the ocean absorbs heat and how the heat that the ocean absorbs uh, determines weather patterns. And when you think about it, uh, it's easy to understand for any, uh, anyone learning basic physics that when the ocean takes up heat, um, uh, it has a heat gradient of this super large area of Earth, and this heat gradient is, of course, essential in driving weather patterns. So any bit of heat we add, or any bit of heat the ocean absorbs or reshuffles, will uh, connect to all of us uh, that we inhabit uh, the surface of the continents. And um, a graph that I find very amazing to explain this is this one. So this is uh, what we know today. The ocean takes up 93% of the excess heat that comes from global warming. And what is always forgotten is that the deep ocean takes up a large proportion because of the water mixing. So even though we are, have not even sampled or have no, very little knowledge of the deep ocean, it is already changing along, taking up not only heat, but also, of course, all kinds of chemicals uh, that we humans put into the oceans. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So what we face today, and this goes far beyond natural sciences, is that we are challenged with the question of what does all of that mean to humanity. And one of the most uh, stressful thoughts is really the uh, thermal expansion of water, which is the greatest fraction of the sea level rise that we are facing. It is still at two thirds of uh, the sea level rise is explained by the heat um, take up of the ocean. It simply, it's a physical law. It simply expands water if it gets warmer. And this causes already, and this is uh, where I lived as a student, Hamburg, is regularly flooded now, very costly, all of this. There's usually a large fleet of cars sunken when we have these uh, um, floods that we cannot predict. But think about other areas of Earth where it's about 100 millions of people who, who lose their homes um, when, when floods emerge. So what we always forget is, uh, because natural scientists tend to report averages, is that it's the extremes that matter. So sea level rise, and even if it sounds uh, small, a few um, a centimeter by, by 10 years or so sounds small, so what would it matter to us? <clears throat> it's the extreme floods um, that have to do with increasing precipitation, change of river flows, and the ocean, of course, that changes everything. And so when uh, we model, uh, sea level rise as a simply the expansion of the um, height, um, and we model the costs that all of the floods and all of the sea level changes um, uh, um, carry um, and have an impact for us. Then we'll see that the damage cur currently increases faster than than the sea level rise, and this is because of us humans. And a common misconception is that in Europe or in the highly industrialized uh, countries, we don't need to worry because we are protected. In fact, damages are huge for the types of infrastructures we have. And um, uh, in London, for example, it is, uh, has been estimated that two thirds of the taxes of all people working in London in 50 years from now will be consumed by fighting sea level rise. And this is, of course, much more than, um, than elsewhere. Hong Kong is one of the famous case studies for the effects of sea level rise. I downloaded this from the internet and you can look it up because uh, it is predicted that um, in the end of the century there is one meter sea level rise, but with the typhoons you regularly have and the floods, um, the, the extremes will bring in four meters into the city with tremendous effects, of course. When we walk across uh, Hong Kong, we can see that uh, it is not uh, made to have four meter higher water levels. And all of this has to do with the way we deal with carbon and the way uh, the ocean will respond. So myself, I'm a polar researcher, and I would like, as a first case study, to show you some of the research we need to do in uh, the polar seas, um, and all of this, again, is connected to, to my and, and your living. Sometimes it's really difficult when you live in a tropical country to imagine that anything that happens as the North Pole affects you. Um, but uh, it is something that we know from our system modeling, of course, um, um, that everything is connected, not only via the weather. When I grew up um, as a student, my very first mission was to, in 93, to the Arctic Ocean, this is the North Pole, this is uh, um, Russia, 
uh, Europe. And at that time, when I was a student, uh, no one talked much about climate change. It was something new. The directors I worked with didn't believe in it. And so as a student, we were there. We were looking at the ice. We were sampling. The ice was four to eight meters thick. And uh, no one could imagine, I couldn't have imagined that when I come later, back later as a chief scientist uh, with my own mission, everyone talks about climate change. And I was there at the time of the smallest sea ice cover in the Arctic ever. I just downloaded the map this morning of the current sea ice. And uh, here you see, this is satellite images that shows you sea ice cover. Now the satellite have no high resolution. They basically, uh, the pixel is a few square kilometers and white suggests that, that there is an ice cover. Blue suggests that the ice cover has decreased to less than 50%. When you look at this carefully and everyone can now access those data, you can see there are blue streaks already right across the North Pole. And the, we know from accessing uh, the area that already today, Ice-breaking ships could, in fact, just steam through the entire Arctic, which was not possible when I was a student. So within our generation, and ask uh, Louis, for example, about this, we have uh, learned how everything can cha change and that we can have a time as students where the concepts that then seem the most dramatic for the future of Earth, they are fast. They, they weren't there when I was a student. I didn't learn about this in school. But then you, as a, in your lifetime as a researcher, it's all you care about. So we have to understand that learning and education and listening to new concepts on the market is, can be very decisive for knowing early on what are important fields of science. Now, polar change matters to all of us. And I just show you a few of the images of when we as polar researchers access uh, the oceans. And this is closer. Uh, close to, to land uh, off of Spitsbergen, everything changes along. See, this is what the satellite images show you as permanent, as thick ice cover. But when you go there as a person, you see, of course, that it's all about ice that has already been melting. And uh, again and again, us researchers report that there is more swimming polar bears than walking polar bears when you go to the Arctic today. We have caught in the uh, Arctic Ocean that comes from a warming Atlantic. We don't know what happens to the whales and marine mammals because they have to travel long distances now to go between their breeding and feeding habitats. And where we built our polar stations, I just visited one of our polar stations in Spitsbergen, it started sinking into the melting permafrost. So it's all about human infrastructure, even in the most remote areas. The carbon that settles onto the white um, ice that you see here sometimes is starting melting the ice from above because we're losing albedo from the dust and the dark carbon that settles on the ice everywhere. And uh, when we go to the large Antarctic or Arctic uh, glaciers, we can stand there and see them fall. It's, this is no time lapse. Uh, it's just when you go to the glaciers, for example, of Spitzbergen, you can stand there. You can also stand at the coast of Siberia and Alaska and see part of the land falling into the sea because the, the permafrost uh, um, is melting transporting giant amounts of carbon. So the amount of carbon that is transported is larger than the carbon that is fixed in the Arctic Ocean. And at home, we see the storm surges that I just mentioned to you. And uh, we have to learn that this uh, warming, the changing of gradients um, influence the jet stream with uh, strong consequences for livelihoods all around the Arctic, but also in our vicinities. So, of course, uh, the underlying research for all of this and the ability for us to predict what is next is very important. Again, this is the map from this morning. So one change, um, again, uh, comparing my time as a student and scientist to today is that much more data are available. In fact, anyone can go and download and look at the data from CS distribution in May. We had the lowest record of all times in the Arctic. So in May, for the first time, the Arctic ice was melting away much more faster than before. Now it seems to take a turn. And every year, all of us sea ice scientists, we stare at the data of sea ice cover. And we never know the deepest, the lowest uh, ice cover. We try to predict it, but it's really difficult to know where these steep sinking curves in summertime are ending. The lowest, as I said, was 2012 when we were out in the Arctic. The Earth system models that we have predict that by 
50 years from now, we'll have a summerly ice-free Arctic Ocean. And just think of the consequences for the marine life I mentioned to you. But there is huge uncertainties in the Arctic modeling. So for, this is a graph that shows you the um, temperature change that we predict for the end of the century, which is where we measure our climate goals against. And um, for um, a study where different Earth system models compared their predictive abilities, we um, can say that uh, we are getting better and better between um, the 60 degrees south and uh, about 60 degrees north. But for the polar regions, we have huge uncertainties because of the feedback mechanisms between ocean atmosphere and cryosphere that are very difficult to predict that often depend on small scale processes to scale up to large uh, patterns. The Arctic is the least understood, and in the Arctic, the least understood is the Arctic winter, which has, uh, is, seems to prime the patterns of atmospheric sea ice and ocean warming. So what we are undertaking in the next two years is the largest uh, polar research expedition ever. It's uh, called Mosaic. It's about uh, um, multi-scale observ observing of sea ice and atmosphere, and it's a large international endeavor where many, many countries come together and uh, people will live on Polarstern, our research icebreaker, and have themselves frozen into the ice and drift with the ice, just as Friedhof Nansen did uh, 150 years ago. This is a super expensive, uh, almost like a space mission type of uh, expedition. It will cost us uh, 120 million euro as of today. More than 60 institutions participate, 60 nations. And in fact, uh, China and Russia are the, the great supporters. Uh, they provide, for example, Xulung, Snow Dragon Research Icebreaker. And Russia will also um, support this mission with uh, helicopters and icebreakers. So together, we will try to fix uh, the lack of data for the Arctic winter. How is this done? So, the, um, in next year, by this time, we prepare for starting Polar Stern to go all the way up um, to have itself frozen into the Siberian seas and then drift along the transpolar drift to be um, basically then um, arriving in Fram Strait between Greenland and Spitsbergen after one year. At Nansen's time, he calculated that he would need three years um, to drift. Actually, Nansen, Fridtjof Nansen, the great Norwegian explorer, lost patience with this drift experiment after a year and started skiing back. At his time, everything was frozen, so for him it was possible to just ski back. Today, that would be impossible. So we, because of the faster ice drift with lesser ice, expect to take one year from September next year to um, August uh, 2020. And around the ice, there will be camps, a network of ice camps. There will be operations of research aircrafts and helicopters, and there will be um, uh, transport of people and food and energy uh, sources with icebreakers back and forth between the ships so that we exchange the people about five or six times, depending on the winter conditions. This is a giant experiment, and all because we need winter data. They are, um, the lack of winter data is really a big problem for the Arctic sciences. And what is also new is that during the expedition, everything is connected. The data streams are connected. There will be real-time data exchange. And there will be loads of modelers sitting at home taking in the data and uh, trying to understand how we can improve our Earth system models with a nested approach from process understanding to uh, projections that have to do with alteration of atmospheric um, heat transport um, that connects basically our expedition to the rest of the world. We biologists are also part of this mission, and we have the same problem as the atmospheric scientists. So this is a compilation of, uh, of data where we have observations, permanent observations, that have to do with changes in ecosystems. And uh, you can see that uh, no one maintains currently an ecosystem observatory anywhere in the inner cycle of the Earth where it's ice covered. So while we have these dramatic changes, we let, as, a, as a scientific community, we really have problems um, to provide the right data that we need to understand how old Earth was before the sea ice is gone. And uh, 
when you all um, are professors, you will look back at this time and wonder why no one has been measuring exactly where the polar bear went. In fact, um, it is as dramatic as that there are no data about the quantitative data about the fate of the polar bears or the whales in the Arctic Ocean. And we will look back in 30 years and uh, the future generations will think we were really shitty scientists because of our lack of providing quantitative data. The problem is, of course, the expenses that it, uh, and the infrastructure it needs to provide those um, observations. And at the same time, there are so many more questions to the Arctic Ocean. For example, um, beyond natural sciences, uh, there is a lot of political sciences, a lot of industrial research on the question, can we not cut short the transport? Everyone depends on transport from this region of the world all around to Europe and uh, America. And so the question is, can we not have a shortcut across the North Pole right into Europe, which will totally change the way we transport goods or we use uh, fossil fuels? And so how this would be possible and when it is possible and under which circumstances with which rules keeps a lot of people busy that are not natural scientists. But all of this knowledge, of course, needs to come together. Right now, there are no ports. There are no um, coast guards. There is no infrastructure. So sometimes when I go to conferences, when the future of Arctic traffic and Arctic oil and gas is discussed, I feel like in the Wild West movies uh, when, when people looked into the, uh, the new land, the new gold, and all of that without having anything in place. And this is a bit the problem that we face right now. Case study two is uh, valuing uh, biodiversity. I have already mentioned that one of the other big unknowns is, of course, the lack of observations in the oceans. And this is a beautiful map um, that was put together um, um, between uh, scientists and, uh, and Inuit inhabiting the Arctic to make everyone understand that uh, livelihoods in the Arctic Ocean are connected to the fate of the great mammals, marine mammals, but of course the fish and the krill and the algae, so everything is connected. And um, I can tell you that uh, as a kid, I grew up listening to the stories of my grandfather, who was a whaler in Antarctica. So it's not so long ago that us humans didn't care about, much about whales. And my grandfather showed me actually from his books as a, a harpoonist. So they used explosive harpoons, which uh, declined the whale population of the large whales, uh, blue whales and, and fin whales, uh, dramatically. And today, we grow up in this world with less than 10% of the original whale population in Antarctica. And what we never talk about is that the original population actually never came back. We protect the whales today. Um, but sometimes we, humans take decisions that are not revisable in our lifetimes and not in the lifetimes of several generations. So no one knew, my grandfather couldn't have known, A, he didn't know that this could happen, B, he told me still that he thinks after 20 years of protection, it would be fantastic to go back whaling. But it's not possible because the whales are simply not coming back, and we don't know why. Some of the smaller whales have returned and have built up bigger populations. But why the blue whales are simply not returning to larger populations is unknown. And it has changed the ocean everywhere, because the top predators are key to the biodiversity of the ocean. Now, we sometimes discuss, is it possible to really have species go extinct in the ocean? The ocean is so large, it's dilute, animals can hide from us. And so I have been again and again to conferences where scientists say, let's not worry about species extinction. There is no evidence that species go extinct in the ocean. But it's, uh, it's not true. We have a lot of evidence when you go to museums then you can see that we've already lost a number of, uh, of species that we have monitored because we humans have made a living out of hunting, for example, the sea mink or the monk seal. So we have even lost small critters. Uh, for example, in Bermuda, there is a famous crustacean uh, going extinct. And with the animals that we lose, we lose, of course, also microbes and their parasites and everything else. This is a joke. Um, that I got from some sailors that said that uh, for sure we have lost the mermaids that were still roaming the seas uh, some 50 years ago. But uh, basically what we need to acknowledge is that it is not true that we cannot uh, have animals uh, or organisms go extinct in the ocean. And we have just uh, uh, turned the wheel for the fate of cold water corals around Europe. 
I don't know if you know this, but uh, with the advent of uh, ocean observation, we learned that the seafloor is as uh, diverse in, types of, in terms of ecosystems as land is. Every 50 kilometers, you are in a different ecosystem. Sometimes they look a bit similar, but uh, sometimes they look as different as those images that you see here. These are all images from, um, from life around the European seas. And uh, in the past uh, 20 years, we have uh, monitored that Europe has lost a large uh, part of its cold water corals at depths between 200 and 1,000 meters water depth. But uh, luckily, we have come to the conclusion that we need to protect them from fisheries. And deep sea fisheries um, is just, uh, has just been stopped in the past 10 years for the sake of these uh, fantastic uh, habitats. They are not uh, protected entirely yet because um, there is still illegal fisheries and there's also still, of course, ocean acidification where we don't know how this will um, affect cold water corals in the future. And then there are these uh, numbers we put out from the census of marine life where by estimating um, diversity of species in the oceans, we can say that uh, there should be a 10 million unknown species. How do we do that? We go to an ocean space, count everything we know, count everything we don't know, go to the next space, count again, and then we extrapolate. And it is this fantastic number of unknown species, some of them looking as beautiful as this little octopod or this uh, wonderful worm or crab. So there is so much uh, fantastic life to be discovered. And uh, when you ask us microbiologists, um, we can scale up the unknown uh, by a few orders of magnitude. So you take a tablespoon of seafloor sediment or a liter of water, and you will face uh, 2,000 unknown types that have not been cultivated, have not been uh, sequenced. Um, so at, uh, when it comes to the diversity of life, we are just in the face of ocean discoveries. And again, because everything is connected, we need to ask ourselves, with all of these unknowns, not knowing what life is distributed where in the ocean and how they are interacting, what are our chances to know exactly how ocean productivity will behave with all of the pressures, the warming, the acidification that I've uh, mentioned before. And it's really difficult, so to me it is uh, um, a great uh, problem that uh, today we, we look, uh, we have satellite images of the distribution of the algae that make half of this, the oxygen we breathe, but we can't actually predict how they change uh, in productivity because all we have is the surface ocean data of ocean color for which we don't have perfect algorithms yet, especially the polar regions that are very essential, have the shittiest algorithms to estimate uh, algal productivity from ocean color. It just doesn't work yet. And there's far too little research done on the question of scaling up um, the sea observations that we have to understand how algae will respond. We don't even know today if the algae that we sample, the diatoms of the Arctic and the Atlantic, if they and the Pacific, if they are still the same as 100 years ago. I've recently learned from a colleague who hosts the largest uh, diatom collection in France that uh, all of the collections they have in the tube are no longer the ones they have as wild types in the oceans because they change in the lab and they change in the ocean. And the only material we have is some frozen material which we sometimes cannot access anymore. And so it's time to put uh, some of the algae of the oceans into the, um, the big uh, frozen um, uh, uh, collections that we have, have up in Iceland and Spitsbergen because, uh, again, in some decades from now, people will want to know what were the diatoms like. Um, at, the, uh, at this time, um, they will certainly change in the next uh, 100 years. This is a fantastic uh, uh, paper that deals with the uh, changes, the multi-pressure changes in the oceans, warming, um, the um, increase of uh, um, acidity in the ocean, and also the increase of, uh, of oxygen minimum zones, which we have discussed much during the recent conference, and all of the changes that will occur not only at the surface, but also at depth. So what do we need? to be uh, better in putting our data together. We, of course, need observation. And uh, let me tell you that satellites are a fantastic tool to monitor the surface, but they're just one puzzle piece of the knowledge we need. So I'm part of the Ocean Science Initiative and other global ocean initiatives where it's about having deep observatories. And uh, we've counted that we'll have less than 20 deep ocean observatories. And they observe only down to, to 2,000 meters, little more. Now you look at these points and you can look at the ocean color map. 
You can, for example, look at the Pacific and see that it is very regretful that no one observes anywhere in the large ocean gyres, except this little observatory um, next uh, to, uh, to Hawaii and Bermuda. These are the one big ocean observatories that we have. There is nothing except directly um, at, at Antarctica, no deep observatory in the Arctic. The northernmost and deepest one is the one that RV hosts. And uh, nothing looks deeper than 2,000 meters. So we really have a big problem with our presence at sea and putting data together. Year-round data is the most difficult to have. Our observatory in the Arctic is monitoring uh, not only the physical changes of sea ice uh, melting, but we have equipped it with a lot of samplers and tools to monitor the production of algae, the sinking of algae, the burial at the seafloor, the behavior of the animals. And I will now just give you two or three cues about what we observe that puts us right next into the connection of the future of society. One data set that we retrieved because we have passive acoustic recorders on our moorings that we put in the ocean, they are energy expensive, we need to exchange them every year. And we've just retrieved the first Arctic data set on human sound in the ocean. What you see here is in red, not the whale singing, it is the shooting of air guns in Fram Strait. So for days, for weeks, there is a constant noise, and that constant noise cuts right into the frequency which with, with which the 23 species of whales communicate in the Arctic Ocean. Here is two days where the air gun shooting stopped. It was probably a long holiday weekend or something. And here you see a little bit of whale singing. And uh, this is a problem that we are uh, um, a problem that we are implementing in the ocean that we haven't looked at before. No one really knows to how much to worry about this. We can only say that if we would talk and there would be a constant giant noise while we try to talk, we would be upset as humans. Uh, we don't know if the whales are really upset and what they can do about it, but we know that we need to watch it. It's some kind of noise littering that we face in many oceans that we really need to look at where we need to understand impact on organisms, but social organisms like whales that need to communicate, to find each other, to alert, to hunt together, to find a partner, for sure I will have a problem over long term with these types of habitats. The other thing that we monitored as a side project was littering in the Arctic Ocean. Now, um, at AVI, we have uh, implemented the monitoring of littering quite early because we were in shock when we did quantitative observations of seafloor. Um, after the, the giant sea ice melt in 2007, the first big sea ice melt, all of a sudden, everywhere where the sea ice retreated, we got this super fast increase of large plastic bags in the oceans. We monitored ship data, and because of the big ice retreat that we face in Fram Strait and towards the Arctic Ocean, um, like the plastic litter increases, we have increased tourism up in the Arctic. Sailboat tourism and uh, cruise shipping and fisheries, everything follows the track of the retreating sea ice. So when we figured out and counted all of these plastic materials at the seafloor, it came out that the uh, littering increases up in the Arctic even faster than off of the canyon of uh, Portugal, the Lisbon Canyon, which uh, we believed was the dirtiest canyon that we are monitoring in Europe. So beyond the European monitoring now, uh, groups of scientists set up international monitoring of deep sea littering. And it is something where I often hear uh, uh, grown-up natural scientists laugh and say uh, plastic littering is just a hype, it will go away, it is uh, not very relevant. But once you really sit there on a ship and you do camera service and you see that by now every second sponge or coral has a plastic bag wrapped around its, its body, with of course effects to it, you start thinking that uh, maybe we've just messed it up completely. And um, if you would do camera transects of, of uh, Hong Kong out to the ocean, I guess you would not be happy about what you see. At ARMY, we now maintain the international litter base where everyone, scientists and citizens and everyone reports uh, observations of littering. And it's quite shocking that even the most remote uh, areas, uh, the most remote beaches and islands sometimes look like this. So um, I have uh, recently had a, a, great, a big meeting at the United Nations where industry, it was actually an industry, not a science meeting, where industry asked uh, what can we now do exactly to avoid this type of littering. And 
a, um, it was a, came as a surprise again that we didn't really, while we grew up, didn't really worry so much about plastic. Now, it's of course a chemistry problem in a way. Plastic was made to persist. So it's so logical that it will also persist in the oceans when it sinks out from UV radiation, which is the only mechanism to really destroy plastics um, over long term. When it's in a dark, cold ocean, it will, not, uh, it will last for hundreds and hundreds of years, and hence it will accumulate. Why no one really thought about this when plastic was invented, which was really helpful, of course, to society for many reasons, including hygiene, cheap clothes, and all of that. I don't know. I didn't think about it. But it's so logic that you wonder today, why did we not think about this problem earlier. Now we face this problem everywhere, and so um, I guess within the next 10 years there will be a lot of new rules and regulations. In Europe, we've just decided to forbid the, the plastic straw, and I saw during the conference you had a paper straw here already at the university, so probably many rules will emerge that should help uh, the problem. If we really manage to get rid of this problem fast enough and soon enough, we don't know today. And this matters again to all of us, so coming back from ocean to society. Another fantastic ocean fact is that we have reached now in 2018 the time when we actually have more fish taken from aquaculture than from natural fishing out in the oceans. Again, when I was a student, it was predicted that aquaculture could maximally contribute 10 to 20 percent of uh, fish nutrition. Today, we are moving towards a predicted a larger, much larger proportion of aquaculture providing fish than natural fisheries. Natural fisheries has destructive elements that we cannot control very well. Aquaculture can have also very destructive elements to it, but there are new technological inventions and new aquaculture robot farms that I saw, for example, in Norway. It's pensive. They will make fish food very expensive, but there are solutions to zero emission aquaculture if one spends more money on seafood, and that is interesting. Now, both the aquaculture community and the fisheries communities have written uh, a lot of uh, complaints recently to, the, uh, to many different companies that the plastic problem uh, faces them as well, because what everyone has forgotten is that the large plastic can turn into tiny small particles. They are everywhere in the ocean. They are in the sea ice and the atmosphere. They are absorbed by sea life and they are eaten by fish, and so the fish likely have plastics uh, in them. And um, um, some countries have already declining fish consumption, and when they ask customers why, they say, because I don't want to eat plastic fish. So this is a bit strange that humans behave this way, because of course on land we face uh, plastic pollution all the time, and in theory the chickens and the, the, and the pigs and everything should have uh, some plastics too, but we focus on the ocean because um, it seems dramatic, and there is one thing that is special about ocean life. It, uh, at the base of the food webs, we often have uh, filtering organisms. So this problem of how we spread small pl particle plasticles to our food webs, to our human consumption, and what it matters for us, is completely unsolved today, a giant new research subject. And all of this will matter, of course, to economy. So I like that paper by Ove Hoog. He is a coral researcher, and he worked with, with economists to try to model costs of human behavior when it comes to ocean resources and values. And um, they uh, figured that uh, if we continue as we do, it uh, may cost uh, future generations some, some 2.5 trillion US dollars, a giant amount. They took various components of ocean resources into account to uh, tell all of us that uh, it matters not only for our uh, moral and ethics standards, but it matters also for economy. And this is my last case study that I want to take you. It is another emerging problem uh, which has not started, but what uh, will uh, potentially start in, in our lifetime. And uh, it is interesting because this time we would have a chance to do it better. So we have many examples of where humans had to intervene with activities that uh, changed the earth, like the ozone hole or like eutrophication or the plastic littering, where we always feel, why did we not start doing things earlier? Why are we coming in so late, even if knowledge was available? And um, climate change uh, probably being the biggest problem of them all. But there is one that might be a big problem, but we still have time to prepare for it. And this is access to deep sea resources. So I don't know how many of you have ever heard of this uh, potential giant uh, other resource. Um, um, a gigantic sum 
of values in terms of uh, metal, metals is lying on the ocean floor as metal crusts. So mostly in the open ocean, we have estimates from geological surveys that really immense values of rare earth metals that we need in high-tech solutions are to be uh, mined from the ocean floor. The most famous one, I grew up with this one as a student. I worked for my university as an assistant to count life on manganese nodules. This is the most famous ocean resource. It's uh, as big as a cauliflower, very heavy. I don't know how many of you could touch a manganese nodule yet. But uh, here and there, you hear already conferences and you read articles that predict that this is the gold of the future when we have uh, depleted the, uh, the resources on land for rare metals. We found them already with the first deep sea expeditions because there are relatively large resources out in the Atlantic, in the Pacific, and the Indian Ocean. They were first fished in the 60s, and then uh, since then we discuss whether there is a, will be a time when society needs to harvest uh, metal resources from the deep sea. Now, this is when you believe in sustainability and not an exact uh, sustainable resource. You can harvest them only once because each of these nodules and many of the other metal crusts needs a million years to grow. And so we take them out and we cannot think about uh, uh, sustainable manganese nodule growth and reharvesting a few million years later. There is nothing in place, no human you, you, uh, resource or concept or law that allows us to plan for two or three million years. Um, of, for future generations, so we take them out only once in our perspective. What is the value of a manganese nodule? Most of it is, uh, is sediment, manganese, um, and, uh, but there are trace elements that are extremely valuable, like nickel, copper, and cobalt. So when you wonder where do I actually, as a human, where do I use nickel, copper, and cobalt? For example, they are parts of the steel we use, um, but they are much more parts of many high-tech solutions, such as your mobile phones, and such as, for example, solar panels, or e-cars, or all of the, or computers. Um, all of the new technology we think will help us also to escape the use of fossil fuels is highly demanding on, on metals. And uh, I love this picture because it explains, again, a problem that we humans face with uh, shifting baseline and knowledge about Earth resources. So in a few generations, we moved from a society that, de that depends only on carbon, calcium, and iron to one that has a very complex footprint of metals that we use for, for our living. We don't really talk about as much in school or in education that this change of footprint of elements that we use, of course, completely changes economy and businesses and the way we deal with land resources. And, uh, but this is very important to understand that the growth we have with high tech um, and the consumption we'll have will really change, of course, businesses because all of these metals are very rare on Earth. There was an assessment uh, to which we contributed to the deep sea research community, especially because we wanted to know what are the chances for deep sea mining within our lifetime. And uh, when you go to the businesses, the world mining productions, and of course China is key in the world mining uh, productions for, for these uh, high tech and energy uh, minerals, then we can find out that on land we have about, uh, we have some resources for 40 years, some of them even less. Uh, in the deep sea, we would have a transition phase resource for 60 to 160 years. But this means taking out gigantic amounts of deep sea floor. It's probably needed because we, uh, we don't know if there would be a replacement of materials possible in this short time scale before we deplete the land reserves. The land reserves are controlled, of course. Every country has access and has their rules for land mining. Some of them are terrible. So if you uh, want to know how these metals are mined and you look up land mining and what the environment looks like after mining, it is, uh, not, very, um, it is it's not very nice. It's, it's already a problem on land, but it will be an even bigger problem in the oceans. Now, where most metal resources lie is not within a country's uh, realm. It's basically in the, in the open oceans. And the open oceans are regulated by the International Seabed Authority that, for example, monitor, uh, has given away licenses from one giant nodule belt in the Pacific. I worked here all my life. Again and again, we came to look at the question of what does the seafloor in the Pacific at four kilometers step has in terms of geo-resources, but also life resources. Now, most countries have 
a licensed area in the Pacific where they are supposed to monitor the distribution of these geo-resources, but also the ecosystems around them. And the International Seabed Authority has split this task so that everyone who has a licensed area splits knowledge with one country who has not the means to do these kinds of investigations. So beyond the question of uh, distributing access to these metals, the International Seabed Authority that has a plenum on Jamaica where they regularly uh, meet, um, they have the general obligation to also look into effects of the environment. They are dealing only with seabed mineral resources. They are not dealing with biodiversity resources, but the rule should be that the access to metal resources is uh, done in a sustainable way. So as researchers, as deep sea researchers today, we have to help um, the um, politicians and the society and the NGOs and everyone with providing data because there is no one else, only science has access to the deep sea. No one else can do deep sea research. Industry could not monitor this themselves because they don't have deep sea research industry. So um, the past 10 years, um, we were worldwide. It's actually all countries, um, all deep sea scientists contribute knowledge to the question of what would happen if we would really depend on deep ocean resources for metals. It's a, it's a big emerging problem with very little knowledge behind it. However, think about the problem with plastic. So it, sometimes you just need a bit of knowledge and then you can provide a logical context. And so even if you have never heard of manganese nodules before, even if you have never seen such a piece of seafloor with manganese nodules, now think for a moment, you see this image, and think how you would actually harvest in a sustainable way manganese nodules. You can see there is life around them, so we immediately need to worry about the fate of life. When we pick out nodules, we cannot imagine that it works like with potato picking or um, any other type of harvest, and even that type of harvest changes the acre that we are harvesting tremendously. So here you have to imagine some robots need to come and collect all of the manganese nodule in one go to have enough because the valuable metals are less than 1% of each nodule. Here you can take a look at the instrumentation that will be built to harvest uh, the metals. This is not a scheme anymore, so several companies have already built those instruments. And just by the size, so this is a human person, this is then a robot that will harvest the nodules. It is also relatively easy to, uh, to think what this will happen to the seafloor if we use this. So there, is, uh, there are schemes and sketches. Deep sea mining has not started yet. However, last year, the first Japanese test of deep sea mining started. Um, it was not on nodules, it was on crusts, which seems to be a more sustainable source because it is a thick layer of metal rather than a thinly spread out layer as with the nodules. And um, this year we will have, this or next year, we will have the first industrial experiment on the questions of the mud cloud that will uh, happen when, when large robots dwell the seafloor. Germany did one experiment where, in, uh, when I was a young student, um, uh, one square kilometer of seafloor was harvested for nodules um, to mimic the future landscapes of the deep ocean floor. And I had the pleasure to come back in 2015 to the very same site and to assess whether the seafloor would have self-healed or whether it would still look like this disturbed landscape that you can see here. So again, even if you're not a deep sea scientist, you can look at the landscape image and you can discover that it doesn't look very natural that there are disturbances. Now, when we returned to the site, we had a robot uh, uh, monitoring the seafloor, and you can imagine how um, excited the scientists were sitting and waiting for the first robot images about the seafloor that was uh, experimentally disturbed some 26 years ago, and this was the images that the robot sent up from the seafloor. And again, you don't need to be a specialist to see that the plow, plow tracks were looked still fresh 26 years later. So we have the means to do experiments in the deep sea, we have the means to monitor the deep sea, and we we'll have the means to access uh, such plowed surfaces of deep sea floor, sample it, and assess what damage is done or what impact is done for the ocean floor communities. And this is exactly what we did and what we are doing today. It's always a big debate, should we scientists uh, assist in industrial experiments or not? 
But in my opinion, of course, we have to because um, I'm using a mobile phone. So if I'm using these metal resources, why would I not share data from my and knowledge to better assess what will happen if we have to use the seafloor? So now you've taken a, a short robot turn across the landscape. And again, it doesn't need an expert to understand that this all looks like disturbed seafloor. What will happen when we mine manganese nodules? This is a cut through the seafloor. You see the nodule and you see that half of it is uh, hanging in the seafloor, in the surface seafloor, and you see the brown layer, which is the oxidized layer of seafloor with all of the critters inside. Below, you'll have a highly compacted, very oligotrophic deep sea sediment. And after these top 10 to 20 centimeters here of inhabited bioturbated seafloor, you'll have this very compact ancient Pacific sediment that takes uh, um, thousands and thousands of years to sediment and build up. So here, at below 10 centimeters depth, we actually have traveled some thousands of years back in time. And this is very oligotrophic and actually very biologically inactive, inactive seafloor material. So what happened when we assessed the plow tracks and we sampled the plow tracks uh, from 26 years ago is we noted that this brown layer never came back. We are actually sampling the ancient Pacific sediments and not even the bacteria that inhabit the normal deep sea floor were able to grow back in this type of seafloor resource um, after 26 years. And the worms did not, and basically none of the sediment in fauna can come back if we take off the oxidized, uh, nutrient-rich uh, seafloor layer. When we take out the manganese nodules, it means that all of this life that needs nodules to breed and to feed and all of that will be taken out. Um, this is a scientific fact. It's not a dramatic statement. It's just uh, what we have observed. And we've observed uh, the craziest critters like this uh, octopod. This is a, a deep sea octopod that lays its egg, that it breeds for eight years. So each mother octopod finds a sponge stalk. The sponge stalk sits on a manganese nodule, and that kind of a sponge that you highly recognize as a sponge is a species that only occurs in the Pacific and only lives on manganese nodules. The octopods lay their eggs, breed eight years, and then new octopods come out. So we have this crazy biology that uses this as a breeding ground. And uh, some of the biological interactions are so intricate that we know that if we would take out giant areas of nodules, of course, it may cost uh, species um, distribution or even species um, may go extinct. This is another scientific fact. So what do we do today? Today, we accompany two big experiments. One is on the question of the extraction systems. What Traces will they leave in the deep sea floor? The other big one is the one on process water and tailings. So beyond the taking out of nodules and seafloor, there will be a gigantic amount of detritus produced by taking out less than 1% of the valuable metals and throwing back all of the nodules and the sediment that you take out back onto the ocean floor. Societal rules have just decided that it is really not allowed to put the dirt directly into the surface waters for the darkening of the oceans and the blackening and the loss of productivity and fish. So what will happen is the ships will have to put pipes and to put the manganese nodule debris back on the seafloor, as if the seafloor would not be inhabited. This is a large experiment started next year by Belgium, who will have the first big uh, piping experiment and, and uh, a cloud experiment made in the deep sea, and uh, we will have an international project accompanying them to look at the impact. So I come to an end with this. Uh, the three case studies that I've shown you are all uh, research where natural scientists work together with social scientists, with uh, economical scientists, with uh, modelers, observers, um, where we report regularly from our data because it all matters also to society. And the, the concept, the framework that we have is one that in the future, we will pay attention to the oceans and land in a way that anything we do, anything we develop should be sustainable. For some of the um, goals that we have put, uh, we have to admit as scientists that it doesn't look too hopeful that we will achieve our targets and goals. But um, when you look at this, all of them matter for, for science and education. For example, how we will effectively till 2020, in two years from now, have regulated harvesting and overfishing as a target that we put out. I guess we have to give up on it, kind of, but some rules at least will help, such as the forbidding of uh, deep coral uh, fishing. By 25, prevent and significantly reduce marine pollution of all kinds. 
only seven years to stop plastic littering also seems kind of not feasible. Um, any kind of minimizing and uh, stopping the impact of ocean acidification is a huge problem, probably still the largest. It's less visible than littering and mining, but uh, to me, climate change, um, warming of oceans and the CO2 uptake and the heat uptake of the ocean remains the biggest one problem society has to address. And all of this needs good education. And so I was happy to hear that here at the Hong Kong Science and Technology University, education will focus on educating a new generation of scientists that uh, know how to use data, that know how to use robots, and then have some type of thinking where sustainability and entrepreneurship can go together. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Now the floor is open for questions, comments, or ideas. Can I just take you up on the start because uh, uh, we teach an introduction to sustainability in other kinds of courses and uh, one of the problems I think that you have is to uh, leave young people with some sense of optimism and uh, a framework for how they might uh, uh, contribute in the future. When you teach this stuff to your students, how, how do you manage to send them out of the room uh, wanting to work for uh, our future? <laughs> It's an excellent question. Yes, so I'll, um, I'll try to give the examples where we really saved Earth between science and society. And the best example, the best case study ever is the ozone hole. So, um, and, uh, so I don't know if you know of this. We, sometimes we forget about this, but we, we would have had, uh, um, what was the recent number? 150 million people would have died by now from skin cancer had we not fixed the problem with the fluorochlorocarbons. This was scientists who found out um, early enough that uh, the chemicals we produce for refrigerators and our kind of industry kill the ozone that protects us from UV radiation. When it was found out, it took 15 years for the scientists to, to have enough politicians on their sides that they would ban um, these chemicals. And so the ozone hole is stabilized. It is not closed yet, but we have the models of what would have happened if we would have not stopped the use of the refrigerator. Um, um, chemicals, and we would, it would be a different world. We all would, uh, would, uh, would die earlier, or it would have been very, very dramatic. This is one example. So I need we collect the good examples where scientists and, and politicians work together to fix things. There are more good examples. What I also teach is hygiene. We all forget how, have forgotten how the world was uh, at the time when people didn't know there are microbes that make you sick. So today, everyone washes their hands with soap, right? Um, if we have healthy water, we can all be fixed. We have fixed the problem of hygiene. 200 years ago, it was a fight for scientists to make anyone believe it's worthwhile using money for that. So when we combine the, the drama where we need to be honest about, we need to tell these stories and show those data, but we can show evidence that humans can fix things as well. That's my approach to it. It's still quite, I'm, I'm still honest, and so I know that sometimes students say, now I get a depression from your class, what do I do next? But um, it's all about honesty, and uh, it, the data don't look good. That is the honest uh, conclusion. How, what do you teach to your students to make them feel in power? <laughs> Something like that. Uh, uh, also, um, uh, the, the, the smoking example, which shows a, a, a possibility of quite r rapid change in response to uh, new facts. People can change their culture, I think. Yeah. But uh, I like your hygiene example. I haven't used that. The enough. hygiene is very dramatic when yeah. you look at the numbers yeah. uh, of how um, Europe was in, in deep problems. And but, you know uh, what? The, the ozone problem the is ozone. coming back. Yeah. Coming back. The ozone it, problem yeah. is potential, is pending. There is some illegal use, uh, we know right. now, um, of, of uh, FCKVs, but, but you know what? So I can tell you, um, I've been to a conference recently um, organized by one institute that uh, looks a lot at climate change. The world is really looking to China, as it's, it's really true, because uh, for um, the quantity of people who live there and their decisions of how their future will look like, and now what circumstances will growth happen, and uh, will, will everyone have a healthier and, and uh, have a more, have better livelihoods, it, it will matter. I mean, the, the fate of the world is really in Chinese hands, as we say in Germany, and this is not, again, it's not over-exaggerated. It is true when you simply look at the scientific data. Of course, India, too, plays an important role. And so if India and China together 
decide they are going to support these targets here um, or pick up some of the sustainability goals and push them through, and you can um, because you have a, a way of implementing rules much faster than Europe, for example, um, then, then the, the fate of, of the world will turn. So we have uh, at the moment uh, very little hope with the US, uh, honestly, that may turn quickly again. But, um, but uh, it is really the matter of a few people, a few scientists and, and uh, politicians uh, together to, to determine the outcome and the future. Yeah, I'm just wondering about the impact of mining and uh, Arctic Ocean and uh, ice melt on uh, marine bacteriophages. I heard a lecture at IAS before they were talking about that, so. Yeah, now that you focus here um, in your study programs, you, you focus on phytoplankton adaptation and viruses a lot. So honestly, the deep ocean is completely understudied about the role of viruses. Normally we say that viruses matter, especially there where you have a fast growth, where you have fast population growth, when organisms like the deep sea life, a sponge or the octopod that I showed you, they are like 10 times slower than any other life we know, or sometimes 100 times slower. And so we don't know, and they're very thin populations, so normally this is not then a, a, a viral prone environment to worry about. What we don't know, and this is discussed in the, in the deep sea mining um, problem, so if, if we really take out so much seafloor, and if all of the, the dirt that comes from the extraction is all thrown back into the sea, and there are big mud clouds uh, wading all over the place, of course we have changed surface area, we have changed particle load, and we probably redistribute microbes and viruses in a way that, uh, that we should better look at. But no, I, to my knowledge, no one studies at the moment the role of viruses for such uh, interactions and such impacts on seafloor environments. It will be a new field uh, for, for anyone that will deal with that. In the Arctic Ocean, we check the um, emerging, emergence of new types of microbes and viruses with warming. So there are programs where we ask ourselves when we increase warming by 10 degrees in a few years, as we do with the Arctic Ocean, uh, note that Today, in winter time, we sometimes have plus degrees at the North Pole already. So we change everything very rapidly. So we need to know which is the next suite of organisms moving into the Arctic. And we, at the moment, observing cyanobacteria, which seem to move in. They have never been in the Arctic Ocean, but they seem to move in right now. They come with their own viruses. So, so again, this all needs research that is just about to begin. Thank you, Angie, for this wonderful uh, talk. Um, I'd like to make a, two comments. The first one, I want to congratulate German and in particular your institute to lead uh, the mosaic experiment. It's, it's 10 years in making. And uh, finally, uh, we, we, we see the, uh, the excitement and then it's the implementation. Uh, China uh, will contribute and then there will be one to two scientists to participate uh, for all the four legs. And then uh, my lab, in particular, will contribute uh, sediment traps. And uh, also my group will do the modeling, uh, the ecological modeling from ice to water, uh, to nutrients, to phytoplankton, uh, to zooplankton. So it's very, very exciting. And I congratulate uh, your institute in German on leading this. I think this is a Excellent example. The second one, I, I hope you enjoyed the seafood banquet <laughs> last <laughs> night. I did. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, if I may, uh, I pick up a little bit on this, uh, the seafood supply, the consumption. Yeah. And uh, I grew up in China, you know, many, many years ago. I never... 20 ate, years ago. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, I never had a raw fish. You never had a raw fish? I, we never had it. It's not in the Chinese you know, cuisine. Okay. And uh, when I moved to U.S. You know, in the late 80s, and then the sushi restaurants, eating the sushi is really rare. Now, you can get a sushi pretty much everywhere, even my small town, a population 8,000, you know, the, our cafeteria, the you know, university, and then, and then we have a three sushi restaurants just nearby, you know, there's so many of them. 
So this is really the globalization changing the people's a diet the culture, and then now you can get sushi and whatever. I think this is the, really the trend now. I I teach this oceans and climate change. I often use the sushi example. One of issues you have to educate, and education is the key from the you know the the various channels. Now there is a movement. And in the U.S., in Europe, and then they want to take out the bluefin tuna of the menu. They did in France, yeah, and they, so the Prince Albert yeah, um, I, took I see, out the tuna already. From yeah, the you know, in the in the yesterday in Sai Kong, you see the aquarium, that big fish. You know, it lives thirty years. You know, twenty years. I feel guilty if they serve that fish on our table. I think that this is the really we have to change and uh, the way. And uh, that only way to out of this is education mm -hmm. and the public outreach, like what you're doing today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. So, so it is really difficult to predict how what society will use next. So no one would have predicted the story of the mobile phone, for example, that now really everyone has had in uh, ten years. We all have had two or three or four, and. You don't know, we don't know today, I looked the papers up, there is a science of, uh, of, of, of littering and disposal and recycling, and no one knows where all the mobile phones go. It's unknown. But this, the, the amount of mobile phones that have been built and used is gigantic. We know about how many were built, but we don't know where they go. And if we would be able to do that type of re recycling in a more efficient way, we would, we would have another 100 years before we need to touch the seafloor. But because we don't have the rules and the recycling in place, um, and we have huge problems with the international trade market of litter, um, then it is just, it, it seems like almost infeasible to, to get to a situation that we can do the recycling, which is so logical. So I find this uh, surprising, and if I would uh, start uh, uh, studying again, I still would love to do ocean sciences, but I would also love to do the study of, of resources, because it's just amazing what decisions society takes and how weird some things are, where it's so logical to find out stuff where things go, but we still don't have that knowledge. And it's, it's very intriguing to do resource studies and to read about what we know and don't know about resources. For example, we don't know about um, the buildings. We don't know how much cement has been used to build uh, homes and buildings. And there is a lot of metal also inside of buildings. And uh, that is needed, that knowledge, to know where we, how we could get them back. And so, yeah, it's all about education, as you say. And I think that education must turn in a way that it, is much more, it much more supports the system approach, where you always think that your core science is, uh, needs to be connected to, to, to human society in a way that you know how your core science is part of the system knowledge um, that we have to, to predict and, and deal with our future. Here's another one. Yeah, you, you mentioned like, it's about cotton, right? I heard that in another place, like they're expanding their range yeah. to the Arctic. So is the reason for that just warming or is there other things about their food? Yeah. So that's a, it's a, a very good question. We have only observations right now. So the Norwegian fishery, after some, some dip where they, they had to stop fishing cod because it was depleted too much, is now blossoming because they have really big, fat Atlantic cods up around Spitsbergen. Even where we have our polar research stations, I saw some of them. And I was surprised because these huge cods, they were actually gone. It seemed like they, they were overfished. And the only explanation for this super rapid migration of these big cods is the warming response. The waters have warmed very fastly, and this gives a bigger home. Now, the other explanation that I bring forward, but I have not published on this, it's just what I observe, is the cod finds a place. They feed from the seafloor, right? Cod is a benthic fish. So they can now, the sea ice goes away. There was no fishing of the seafloor yet. So they come in and they find a very rich seafloor full of polychaetes, full of worms and life they can feed upon. So they have two. They have warmer waters and more food. Now, when the fisheries comes in, when they fish cod, it's benthic fisheries, they take out the seafloor. And there we are discussing right now with the Norwegian Polar Institute how long they can maintain these new fisheries up there because I can already see with our cameras they have started destroying the seafloor that was a very healthy seafloor five years ago. 
You can see that, huh? The fisheries takes out just as manganese nodule mining, it takes out the surface from the seafloor. And I follow, we follow the, the, the receding sea ice line, and we see how fishery moves in and takes out the seafloor. And then after five years, I guess the cod will crash again. So, but if you go to Norway, you will see this big fat cod everywhere, and they are so happy about warming. Um, I was recently at a conference in Tromsø, where the economy minister said, "You, um, all of you strange ecologists, you can go away. Uh, Norway is happy about climate warming. Uh, we, we will be very rich even if we don't use oil anymore. And we don't want to be protected from climate change by you who live in those countries where you can make wine. We want to make the wine ourselves. So we have these discussions uh, really with authorities, with politicians today. Yeah, I got a bit of a crazy idea, but I will continue in the mood of the Gordon Research Conference we had in this room and will, well, uh, even if I hesitate a bit to uh, suggest this idea, I will do it. It, it came from your mermaid. Uh, picture. <laughs> so, you know, a non existing um, uh, living thing uh, uh, that disappeared. And I was thinking if we go back uh, a couple of centuries ago, there were lots of uh, sea monsters uh, that for people were very real. They, they were not imagination, you know, they, they think they existed really. And uh, over the centuries, as science progressed and the explorations went on, we have destroyed these living things. And in a sense, when we didn't have any more to destroy, we have started to destroy real species. So you will think, uh, you know, it would seem that the uh, destruction of species, not of organisms, but of species, is part of our way of life, or it's part of our genome, I will say. And uh, it is not recognized as such because we think that we are destroying species because we are destroying individuals, you know, we are killing birds or whatever, and finally we destroy a species. But maybe it's part of our way of, uh, you know, the, of um, human beings to destroy species. And Perhaps if we recognize that, I don't know, maybe I'm totally wrong. I'm just, uh, you know, we started by destroying monsters and now we destroy real species. If it is so, well, it has to be studied to find out why we destroy species. Yeah. How is it happening that we do that? And if so, maybe we'll, if we understand this process, we could stop it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, in fact, it is studied. Um, I also went to a conference about the philosophy and ethics of, uh, of species loss and species destruction. Um, it is believed that humans are the only animal on Earth that, uh, that lets uh, other animals or other species go extinct. Of course, extinction is, uh, has happened always also without humans. And uh, it can come from large uh, um, geological um, events or meteorites. Uh, we have evidence in, in the history of Earth that species extinction is actually not a rare event. We sometimes confuse also extinction from adaptation. So of course, a species lasts only some, some maybe up to a few tens of millions of years, and then it's another species. There will be no continuation of species forever, except some very few types, some very fossil types of life that seem to defeat the, the role of evolution in a way. But is it really true and what does it actually mean? So when you look at uh, human beliefs and human culture, you find, of course, it's not one belief, not one culture. There are so many different approaches to nature. And I was very fascinating by, fascinated by reading a book about Pacific Islanders' approach to preserving um, nature and species even when they had, had phases of hunger. So you would think humans would always go and eat everything just because they're hungry and because, or because they want to have a better livelihood, but it was not so. The invention of the taboo system is what I read. Taboo, a, a mountain that is taboo, an island that is taboo, an ocean side that is taboo, came from the necessity to preserve. And so we have opportunities uh, to deal with our beliefs and our rules in a way that we can decide to protect or decide to get it right. Um, if we can do that today, it, it would need a completely new global culture. I mean, this is what we are talking about when we're talking about sustainable development goals. But what, because what it actually means, and this is where the stress comes from, it means actually that we decide 
some parts of human population cannot live like we Germans and Americans lived for the past 50 years. Not everyone can have five mobile phones, not everyone can um, have a refrigerator. That's a really hard question. When I go to, to social science or philosophy meetings, they say often we cannot do that, especially not as Westerners. We cannot turn around and say to two thirds of the population, well, we've used it up and now you deal with it. The solution is difficult for that. But I still believe in solutions because if we just value nature enough, it seems like not a punishment not to have five mobile phones, but uh, it could be organized in a way that it seems actually like some, doing something good, feeling good because we're doing something good and we're having a nice nature to deal with. But how to implement this really in our brains um, um, I, it will not probably not happen in my generation. And I don't know the solution to these questions, except maybe uh, working really hard on our morals and, and ethics. Yeah, probably um, uh, looking at that line, the, the, the cynical way would be uh, the average uh, extinction rate through Earth's history, if we go, don't consider those mass extinctions, is four and a half million years. So if you think from the first Australopithecus to Homo sapiens sapiens, we are right there. So this is something to <laughs> consider, right? Uh, so if we go extinct now, and I think we, we work very hard on that, it'll be just normal part of uh, uh, Earth history, right? I, but I have um, in that line two comments. I mean, one... One is communication. You just won, and congratulations, the Communicator Award of the German Science Foundation, a very prestigious award in, in our country. And, um, but, but here we are 20 people, right? We have a very renowned scientist. And I think we as professors have the problem that we don't reach the broad public. I mean, I mean politicians with Twitter do that. We are pathetic in our publications <laughs> and take from an idea to, to getting something out two years, whereas they need two minutes, right? And something that made me think, I have this wonderful godchild, uh, um, uh, Sandra is her name, she's uh, 15. And uh, she and her friend, they're very good looking German blonde young ladies, right? They, they make with their iPhone those movies, right? Like 10 stupid things to do about shopping, right? <laughs> And if she goes, she gets about a million hits from other young people on each of their movies. They, they've, they've found that niche, and many other young people, they need an iPhone and get hundreds of thousands of hits on all they do. So I think we as this uh, academic community have not found a response on how we um, get the attention on what you've just done wonderfully in this talk to the younger people. I mean, this is for all of us uh, yeah. to, to consider. And I think the other thing on humankind is, is, is greed trumps ethics, right? And that, that doesn't, doesn't fare very well. And the third point, when we, you and I worked for politicians in, in our country or whatever, the one thing we are forbidden to write in those papers is overpopulation. Right? I mean, to, I, think, I think on that level we want to live here and do live here at the moment. I think we can sustain a billion, probably two billion people, but not eight. And this is something else we are kind of not allowed to talk about in a transparent way as scientists because it's politically not wanted. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, and another big uh, question to science, uh, philosophy, and history is how many humans can Earth actually support? It's not known, and uh, some, of the, some of the things we read and say are not really based on, on good grounds. I've read the, the publication that the Pope wrote together with John Schellenhuber, <laughs> the climate scientist that I admire, and they, together they wrote that it is uh, wrong that Earth can, must have much fewer people. It's about the organization and, again, the belief, um, and then we can figure it out, and it doesn't need to be um, that much less. Uh, it probably cannot be endlessly more, but uh, there is room, and there is a way of, of organizing it better. Organizing it better is really the key, so it, and that is where we need the other sciences. So in the natural sciences, we have a hard time talking about values and uh, measuring values, for example, of biodiversity in the ocean is impossible. But in the political sciences and the economical sciences, we could think more about other solutions. And I have a good friend in Berlin, 
that where the students uh, actually went to the street to demonstrate they won't, do not want any longer old-fashioned economy classes. They want to talk sustainability and be taught modern economy, not the same economy that uh, ruined our world, but fresh and young and new economy. And uh, that uh, moved me a lot. Uh, I, I never thought of that, that this could happen, that students say, go away, you old professors. What you taught is a disaster, and we want young professors who teach us about sustainability. <laughs> so they, they uh, blocked the lecture classes for, for weeks. And now the president has to discuss with the students what type of economy classes they actually need. <laughs> so it's something to think about. And uh, I think uh, I would like to sit in, a, in an economy class here to hear what is taught, what type of economy, for example, is taught. That uh, would be amazing for me to find out. Okay, I think uh, um, we would like to thank Professor Batia for the um, to sharing all this inspiring the vision and also thank many you. good ideas how to make the society sustainable. But I think that will also be the food of thought for the remaining of our life. Okay, with that, I <laughs> thank, thank you. you for your uh, coming here to for these events and have a good day. Thank you.